Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 57th episode of GBR. And once again, we need to keep it short in the front end of the show because we have to have the maximum allotment of time for our interview with guitarist Thomas Blug, who's also the founder of Blue Guitar. We just spent an hour and 15 minutes in Germany talking to Thomas, and I think you'll really get a lot out of this interview. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about two new episodes of our brand new podcast, GBR Focus. And if you've not listened to the trailer or any of the new episodes, you may want to head over to GBRFocus.com after you finish up here. And just to give you a quick sense of what we're doing over there, well, here's the deal. Guitar Business Radio, where you're at right now, well, this podcast is about people and their experiences in the business of guitar. We talk to players, CEOs, builders, entrepreneurs, and others who share their milestones, challenges, lessons, and much more in our long-form interviews. GBR Focus, on the other hand, is about companies, brands, products, services. But just like right here, there is no idle chatter over there. We present a strong foundational understanding practical applications, straightforward benefits, and acquisition strategies. And if you think that sounds like a bunch of corporate mumbo-jumbo, well, don't just take my word for it. Listen to a couple of episodes, and you'll understand exactly what I mean. For instance, in episode one, we talked to Ryan Elowat, founder of Custom Sound Instruments, who just launched their new blues box guitar line that sports, among other features, a variable setup option for alternate tunings. Or in episode two, we talked at length with Sean Massavage, CEO of the company that's developed Fret Zealot. It's a highly refined LED edition that can be installed on practically any guitar and soon ukuleles and more. It's all operated by a robust mobile app that can deliver sophisticated learning tools all the way to wild light shows and more. I do truly believe that if you like Guitar Business Radio, you'll enjoy GBR Focus. So check it out. Let us know what you think. Now, while you're planning your escape route to GBRFocus.com, we're going to move deliberately and methodically to something completely different. My guest on GBR today is the multi-talented guitarist Thomas Blug. He's recorded numerous albums, written music for TV and movies, and in 2004 received the Strat King of Europe Award celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Fender Stratocaster. Along the way, his technical talents were on display as a sound designer and consultant with Hughes and Kettner amplifiers for like 27 years. And then about five years ago, Thomas launched his own company, Blue Guitar, and their flagship product, the Amp One, has spawned a variety of related products and accessories. It's a long interview, so let's get started as Thomas Blue joins us right here and right now. Hey, Thomas, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show with us all the way from Germany. Uh, welcome to GBR. Hey, big pleasure having me on your show. Thank you <laughs> for inviting me. But, uh, mm -hmm. So let's start off with some uh, history of Thomas right. Blug and, and have you tell us something about um, what it was like growing up and what things, you know, do you think made the biggest impact on you as far as the direction you ended up taking later on? Right. I mean, you know, as a kid and a teenager, I always loved to listen to music. And um, my father was working at the university in psychology and in teaching how to teach and stuff. So there was a lot of talking in the house and a lot of people talking. And as a kid, I was not that much interested in the talking. <laughs> so um, my father took me to the university 
um, you know, like next to his office, there was an office and I could uh, do my homework for school. And then when I finished my homework, you know, what are you doing? I was, you know, walking around the building and see people. And it was kind of boring because, you know, a lot of professors with jackets talking and nothing happening. <laughs> but the, yeah, and the most exciting guy in the whole building was a technician, the guy who repaired all the electronic gear that was used uh, at this university. They had like um, TV and they had a, a studio where, where they could um, kind of film themselves to analyze whatever behavior and strategies and, you know, that, um, and, and, and just this, this technician guy was fascinating to me and uh, I kind of liked the guy so I stayed at his room and I watched him with his soldering iron and then uh, you know repairing stuff and going to this room and to that room and 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 then you know I was hanging around with this technician and then oh, he he kind of gave me some things to do and I started to build you know my first little electronic thing that did some blinking you know <laughs> stu yeah. st stupid things that you do as a kid but that's and, um, the basics the basics right yeah right yeah so so you know so i had this this kind of thing going on at least up to the age of 10 11 oh wow and, yeah and and the, the playing was not even there at, at that time i was you know following my father again and the most interesting thing i found at um, some other places when he was visiting students, it's they had big record collections, or at least some of the guys. And <laughs> um, I found, you know, music to listen to, you know, other people's music to listen to. And, um, you know, in their record collection, I found like the Rolling Stones, stuff that my father wasn't, was not listening to. My father was into classical music. Sounds you know, like Bach. Yeah. That yeah, wouldn't surprise Bach. me from what you're describing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he's like a Bach, Beethoven and all this, you know, heavy music. And it's like, nah, it was not my cup of tea, especially not back then. And then, you know, I was listening to, to, to this cool Rolling Stones and, you know, even some blues music, um, uh, Albert King, Freddie King, Freddie King. You know, nobody in Germany was listening to Freddie King. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and, and like shadows, you know, the, the, the um, oh, yeah. Hank, Hank yeah. Marvin, you know, yeah. so, um, and this was kind of when I'm looking back at, at, at the music I was exposed to at that time, you know, especially like the shadows, this was kind of the first instrumental guitar music for me. And this kind of created nice pictures in my head. I could listen to this kind of music. And I could dream and I could see, you know, like a little movie listening to this kind of music, instrumental guitar music. And, um, well, this was kind of, I was maybe 10, 11. And then one day I picked up a guitar, you know, at one of those places and probably somebody watched me and I just, you know, just trying to, to, to make a noise with that, that guitar it was an acoustic guitar. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, I mean, at least I spent some time with this kind of instrument and then I was given a, a guitar as a birthday present <laughs> and then, um, it was an acoustic guitar, but actually I found it a bit boring. So I found a pickup in, in some, um, electronic, uh, catalog from, you know, one of those electronic part suppliers. Right, right. Sure. The, because at that time I was at the level where I, I was building my first home stereo system. Oh, really? Um, so you're getting, you'd really advanced the processes quite a bit, huh? Right. I, I mean, you know, imagine if you start with like eight or so with electronics and then now I'm 11 and I've, I've done my first power supply and, and then, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing this, you know, building stuff. In, and then I remember, uh, yeah, my first stereo system was a, a, a copy of a Bose. Oh, I don't know the number of 902, you know, oh, the one sure. with, yeah. with, with, yeah, mid, yeah. So, so this, this was kind of what I've done at this age. And then when I had the guitar, you know, just the acoustic guitar was like 
okay, plucking a few notes and playing, maybe trying to play a chord. <laughs> uh, but I, I saw this pickup and then I, I bought the pickup and I put that into the guitar and then hooked that up to the, the stereo system. Okay, so you, re- <laughs> you, you closed the loop and uh, started making some uh, louder music. Yeah, so this was kind of the magic link to have this guitar amplified. And and then I found out about, you know, all the problems in guitar amplification from the beginning. You know, the first thing was the feedback of, of an acoustic guitar with a pickup, yeah. you know. And then, of course, I, I like this overdriven sound by the blues players and, you know, Eric Clapton and uh, the Stones. And then I, step one was uh, acoustic guitar is boring. I need an electric guitar. Okay. And uh, so I got a proper electric guitar, which was a, a Stratocaster copy mm-hmm. um, from Japan. I think it was an Aria area. Uh, sure. Yeah. I remember those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, um, okay, I had that guitar. And then I found a lot of things in in some papers like you could build uh, some overdrive stomp boxes you know with a uh, some diode clipping and maybe an op amp and stuff like that so i built my own overdrive pedal and you're and, and you're how old at this time okay this was about 13 oh, i think my goodness okay yeah <laughs> and and then i discovered that you know all my homemade guitar things were kind of not the real deal. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, imagine I had, you know, my hi-fi stereo system with an EQ and some overdrive box in front of it. <laughs> uh, for, and, and so I asked somebody, you know, what is the best guitar amp on the planet? And the guy goes, uh, let me think. And he said, you know, Carlos Santana, he plays Mesa Boogie. And um, I heard, I never heard about Mesa Boogie, you know, and, but... Uh, if if this guy told me it's the best amp, then you know, of course it was the best amp because the guy told me. <laughs> and they were so expensive. And I had to save a lot of money and work uh, during um, you know when when I was not going to school to make this money. And finally, I ended up buying a Mesa Boogie Mark II. Okay, okay. So this was a, this must have been in the eighties sometime. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. This must be like 80. I think this was about 80. Sounds about and, right. Um, and having this amp, uh, okay, just, yeah, just just briefly before that amp, I, I bought that amp, I had a, a little band with some of my school friends, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it, I started out with a drummer first. We, we started as a, <laughs> you know, uh, just drums and guitars, no bass player, no singer. So it was a, it was a duo <laughs> at that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's put it that way, kind of lousy, but the drummer was already playing for a bunch of years. Like, uh, So he was pretty good. And, you know, then we had a third member who was a bass player and a singer. Mm-hmm. And I had the proper, you know, tube amp. And this was the magic starting point where I discovered, man, you know, having a band, having an amp and playing the guitar is magic. And this, I, I got so excited. I was, I was, you know, spending all my time just playing the guitar. Actually, it gave me troubles at school because I was pretty, you know, good having, you know, I was interested at school, but then, then you know, at that phase, I, I was spending more time with the guitar with, than with anything else. So I went in school. I remember, ah, and now I remember. I had an exercise how to, to change the pick in my hands from a kind of, I used to pick in between my thumb and my first finger and then kind of get it away to make finger picking. And sitting at school, um, you know, all the hours I was changing the pick in my hands. So this was my exercise. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. So you get a little dex- dexterity uh, while you're trying to learn uh, whatever it is you're learning. Right? Yeah. 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 And, um, but anyway, I was, I was crazy um, about the playing and I forgot about, you know, um, really the electronic sides besides that at a certain point I found 
my 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 Mesa boogie was not as big sounding as you know Jimi Hendrix or <laughs> some of the rock stuff, you know, more like mid rangey. Uh, um, and then I started to modify my Mesa boogie. You know, I made this two channel amp. I, I built my own um, like crunch channel that that gave it a third sound that was not such a high gain sound but more like you know a bigger um drier and punchier sound and then i discovered you know the mesa boogie is maybe good but uh, my heroes all played marshals ah, <laughs> right. you know and at that stage my heroes were like um uh, richie blackmore the purple right. heavy heavy influence gary moore gary moore mm -hmm. is a uh, you know british uh, blues rock player who was into fusion at uh, in the late 70s as well right and um this guy was a big influence on my playing and then uh yeah of course i listened to other music like toto some american guitar players as well but to be honest my main guitar heroes came from the from the uk right like right. Uh, i don't know why but this is like well there's some geographic relevance there but uh yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean of course you know but maybe there's another little thing about the style uh -huh. you know most american players they have more jazz influence to their style this i can feel and hear more jazz through the american uh, blues and 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 the U european guys they are actually kind of a bit easier <laughs> i see i see yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah but but you know like gary moore he was like uh his emo the way he played was so emotional so so he was so much on fire that that really got me yeah, yeah, yeah. so you uh so you you continued to play um this is uh you, did you you stayed in school until how long well, you know, I got into trouble at school. My father told me, you have to finish your school. So to, to that, uh, whatever it, it's in German, it's called Abitur, which is like, after you finish this, you can go to, to, to a university and study. Mm -hmm. So he said, you have to finish this properly, which was being 17 or 18. So it's, it's like we would think of as high school or? High school. Yeah, that's yeah. high school. So, so, you know, I, I finished that degree. Um, so I, I've done this properly. <laughs> and um, actually at school, I could um, choose some courses to have to, to be the more relevant ones, which I choose. Uh, one is English because, you know, all my music was English music, mm -hmm. um, basically a, a few exceptions from, from Germany. Like, uh, I liked, uh, Nina Hagen, you know, Gina, mm -hmm. Nina Hagen. I heard She's, the name. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. She, she, she was like a, a, a huh, pop punk singer, very mm -hmm. exciting, different, uh, singer. And, uh, but, but, you know, 99% was, was like, uh, English music. Uh -huh. So I was, uh, English was on my, then of course, uh, uh physic, physics and music. Yeah. So, um, and those all relate to the rest of your life pretty much. <laughs> well, it, it was that simple, you know, the stuff that I have done as a teenager, which were my hobbies and which I had the passion for, I just continued. There yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even think about anything else, you know? So you really, like, so, you know, to make the point, you, you really did build a pretty solid foundation, uh, mm -hmm. in your first 18 years, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you were able to build on. And that's one of, certainly one of the clearest examples of that sort of thing that I've, I've heard in, in quite a while. Everybody has something, mm -hmm. uh, but clearly uh, the two things that we're going to talk about going forward uh, were mm -hmm. really a very, very strong part of your upbringing and, and learning and your hobbies and passions and things you were interested in growing up. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And for me, there was never a, a big issue. What will I do in my life? I just followed this natural, whatever instincts and, and, and the thing that kind of 
uh, fascinated me. In the end, it was about fascinating. And the other big thing that I learned even at this young age is how I learn stuff um, myself, you know. So the, the, the other point is my father being at university, um, I, I knew how a university looks from the inside and I've seen, you know, all the seminars and the whole big things. And, and at that time in Germany, um, you could study a few things, but I didn't want to go music because music in Germany at that time was clearly about classical music and not even jazz. You know, it's like, and I was not about this kind of music. Right. So, you know, going to university and study music was not an option for me and uh, electronics okay but i was too much fascinated about music to do that and on the other hand just uh, what happened in in my life at that time i was already making some money as at that time because i played in in like uh, I had like three bands at the time when I was 17, mm -hmm. you know, I was super busy. I had like one, two cover bands and, or, or maybe one cover band and two with, uh, original music that I wrote. And, um, with the cover bands, I made some money, which was uh, kind of, uh, Im impressive because, you know, you are a teenager and we, we were like, ah, now I remember. Okay, I had one three-piece band and this was making good money because three, three people, I don't know how, 300 Deutschmarks a night. And hey, it was a lot of money for a guy like me at that age. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like you, you had your first foray into the business, as we would say, uh, yeah, at a yeah. fairly young age. And that got you started uh, right. And what would become your career on the side of right. being a player. So you started doing that. And as you got away from school, uh, did that playing continue? And did you continue to develop uh, more of an income stream there? Or did you have to do something else or what? Yeah. OK. Of course, there was more time to kill. Um, which was not a big problem for me because <laughs> I had so, you know, so many things in my head, like writing songs. But of course, I moved out from home and I needed more money and I wanted to buy a car and my, my parents are not like wealthy. So um, the lesson I learned from home was if you want something, you have to work for it. So you have to make the money for the stuff that you want, even for guitars at that time. Of course, I got a present here and there, but it was like... Hey, if you want to buy a Mesa boogie, you know, uh, hey, this is like crazy. You know, it's like you are a teenager and you, why do you want the most expensive amplifier on the planet? You know, <laughs> and, you know, you know, I probably give you a hundred, you know, but uh, this thing was about 5,000 Deutschmarks, wow. you know? So, so, so I had to make the money myself and this is all already a good lesson of course i was not so excited about uh, that at that time but in long terms it, it was a very good lesson because if i want to achieve something i had to go for it you know it's what it wasn't like i call somebody and somebody gives me the money to 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 get there no it was no question for me i have to do it myself sure and and then, you know, at that age, when I was like 1920 and I moved from home and I, I, I wanted to buy a car, uh, I needed more money. So, and I, I gave lessons to um, other guitar players. Um, I was pretty good at that age. And um, so just to make money, I gave lessons. And um, I had a few or maybe, I, I don't know how many, how many but uh, so I had some income stable income from being a teacher i had some income from being a, a gigging musician right and i already had a little money from being booked as a session player i mean this was like the craziest thing ever when i i think back of i was only 17 i didn't have a car and i was hired to play in the studio and i mean I started playing the guitar with like 13. So I, I only played like four years and they already paid me money <laughs> to record, you know, like in the studio. 
If yeah. I think back, this is like crazy. And it, and it all happened, happened naturally because, you know, one guy in, in one of my bands when I was a teenager, he, he was older. Most of the guys at that time were older than me. And one of the guys, uh, he worked at a publisher and a music publisher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then, you know, he knew that I, I was kind of good guitar player. And then he rec recommended me to, to a producer who was working at this part publisher as well. And, and so, you know, my, my mother had to drive me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you got you know? there, you got there one way or the other. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So it, uh, um, it, it all hap happens by accidents kind of, you yeah. know, because of yeah. words of mouth and, uh, you know, this was all I was doing. I was just going for it. <laughs> so when you when you uh, got a little older and you say 1920 mm -hmm. or getting starting to get into your 20s, what did that look like in terms of uh, what you were doing? Uh, you were starting to play more. Um, how did that uh, How did that unfold? Well, you know, I I I played more, yeah, and of course, more people saw me playing. Then I was asked by more people to play in the studio. And then um, at that time here, we had um, a, a local band that were, was more like a synthesizer pop music, like the Depeche Mode mm -hmm. uh, from, from the UK. And, uh, and they still wanted some, some guitar. So they, they booked me for, for a session in the studio. And then <laughs> it's another funny story. Okay, I played some guitars on their first record, and then another. They they became became kind of um, successful. So, and at a certain point, uh, this band had an offer to go on tour as a support act with another band from the same record label. And then uh, these guys were a year or two younger than, than myself. And, and they, they've just been in the studio playing synthesizers. But um, they both also played um, acoustic instruments. One guy was playing drums uh, besides synthesizer, and the other guy could play some acoustic guitar. And um, so they asked me, hey, how can we put a band together to go on this tour? And I said, okay, I have a good friend. He's a killer bass player, my friend Andy. And you know what? Uh, if Arno plays the drums, I play the electric guitar. And Walter, the singer, he plays some acoustic guitar and maybe keyboards. That's the band. And uh, so I kind of put together the band for them. And we, we went on tour. And uh, okay, after this tour, there was another tour. And then I was seen by some guys from this rocket rec record company and then they asked me to to join in, in another band you know and so in my 20s i was touring sure yeah yeah and um it, besides having my own bands and uh, and and then in my 20s another thing happened was um Houston Kettner, which is a, a an amplifier manufacturer sure we all know them mm-hmm Yep, uh, and they they were looking for a demonstrator because um, the company back then was very very young. Nobody speak English ex except for one guy, and he was like in marketing. And um, so th th you know, they, and they had they had a guy that that was demonstrating their products, but this was a, a guy that was mainly into acoustic guitars. So mm -hmm. he his electric side was not so killer. So there I was, the young guy being invited to, to the Usen Kettner uh, office, and uh, you know, uh, so I, I could show them on paper my degree in English that I had from school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had no practice, so okay, it worked, but uh, you know, you have to use a language to be exactly, yeah. Yeah. And um, so the other the other side being the player, they all know me because uh, it's in the area where where I grew up. So they knew me as a guitar player. And then they sent me to uh, it's what it was probably a NAMM show or something else. I, I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. So but it was in, in the United States and and to demonstrate their first amplifier on a trade show. And I. Um, this amplifier was a very sophisticated piece of gear. It was like a 
a programmable amplifier with two speakers and built-in effects and you know uh, it could do a lot and I came up and I even composed some music to to use uh, you know the several sound options of this amplifier and make this amp shine you know to to demonstrate uh, the different sounds and and um, when I came back from from this trade show I told him that I liked the concept but I didn't like the sound <laughs> <laughs> okay well there you go that's yeah, uh, and that how did that go over uh, well, that's typically me. I'm, I'm, I'm straightforward. I'm yeah. honest, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so they said, uh, -huh. um, <laughs> well, uh, w w what do you mean? And what do you want? And I said, it's pretty simple. I work in the studio and I have, I had my Marshall, which, uh, was already modified by myself. And I had my Mesa boogie, which was modified and I had a Fender and a Vox. So I had all, you know, the, the iconic classic amps that, you know, you have been used by, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Richie Blackmore and my heroes. And uh, uh, I could prove that these are, you know, the real deal amplifiers. And um, so I brought all these amps in to the Houston Kettner R&D. And uh, the next, I think, 27 years I, I spent in... R&D at Hughes and Kettner doing demos and uh, yeah, yeah well, I designed that's a long time <laughs> yeah but this was freelance yeah so so um, there were phases where I spent more time than a full fully employed, employed uh, person but there were times where I was more busy with touring so you know right. so and then the big question always was from from the outside what is this thomas bluke is he an artist is he you know uh, uh, an amp designer and <laughs> some people want to, to see me you know just being the artist uh, and other people said yeah yeah you should quit the music you should you know just settle down and just do this uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and i I've never seen the two things apart. It's but, like, but you really kind of, they were really kind of parallel careers though, right? Yeah. Now, going at the same time, uh, connected, but uh, also separate too. Sure. And I, here's a, a typical example. I was in 2004, uh, Fender Europe had, an, had a, a contest um, uh, uh, to celebrate 50 years of the Fender Stratocaster in Europe. And my webmaster back then for my uh, website told me to enter this contest. I, I, you know, I was never a guy that was interested in, 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 in competition or contest or anything. But he, he was a marketing guy and said, you play the Stratocaster and you are very good. You should enter this contest. Oh, and I... And by the way, this was Andy, the guy, the bass player. Right, right. <laughs> I was trying. Yeah. yeah. And I said, because he was such a good friend, I said, okay, I do it for you, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, so I sent some music and then uh, they, they wrote back and they, they had a pre whatever uh, contest in Germany. And I entered that one and I, I won on that level. And then I got invited into the final contest, which was held in the UK. And at the same time, when the Fender contest was going on, I was booked to go to China uh, to inspect a factory uh, for using Kettner, um, you know, to, to look after production quality. And <laughs> I had to, to, to postpone my, so to speak, business trip to China because I had to, to, to do the finals at the Fender uh, Strat King, uh, uh, Str yeah, Strat King uh, finals. And then uh, <laughs> I, I was in the UK, so I flew to the UK. And um, the Hughes and Kettner guys were not so excited about that, of course. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I was at this finals and then I finally even won that contest. So I got awarded the Strat King of Europe in 2004. And then I had this award and then um, um, they changed my ticket to China. And then when I flew into China, 
this was kind of even the weirdest thing that ever happened. You know, the Chinese factory, all the workers, like 200 people, were lining up in front of the building. <laughs> I was coming straight from the airport, you know, like 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 a president, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can know, picture and, it right now. You know, like like a military ceremony. I, I was walking into this factory. I was giving flowers, and you know, and and they had a local radio, and it's like this is the Strat King of Europe. Nobody knew what <laughs> that was. <laughs> but yeah, you were okay. you were a celebrity, that's for sure, right? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> on that day, you yeah, know, yeah, that day, yeah. yeah. Next day, I was in the factory, and and of course, every things you told to the to the workers um, was already gone three weeks later. Because in in China, especially at that time, the, the the rule was kind of if you educated a worker, the worker had more knowledge, and he went to the next factory and got asked for more money. <laughs> right. Well, that's yeah. the way it um, works. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. And um, okay, now I got my own company, and I know all that, and I also yeah. work with Chinese, but I know how to deal with that. <laughs> well, sure, and I want to, and, and that kind of gives me a good cue to, to <laughs> kind of get into uh, blue guitar, right. uh, because I think we want to know uh, how that got started, and uh, I'm sure there's a good story there, and there's a lot to talk about with blue guitar. So, uh, how did how did that ev all evolve? Well, I mean, maybe the whole thing started with my music because if I go back uh, in the music career, I, I, I've been a session player, I've been on tour with other bands and I mainly played their music, not my own music. Mm -hmm. And the bands with my own music, they were not so successful. But I always had, you know, uh, you know, um, I write, I wrote songs, I wrote, you know, instrumentals, which I use on the trade shows, and then even formed my own uh, instrumental band with um, a very famous guy called uh, Thijs van Leer, who is um, the organ and flute player of the band Focus from the Netherlands. Uh -huh. um, okay. Hocus Pocus was like... Uh, I think a number three in the U.S. charts in 1973, <laughs> wow. so a long time ago. <laughs> but um, if you are into the real deal of instrumental music, maybe you know. And Ty's played in my instrumental band, the Thomas Blue Band, for like 10 years. And uh, we're still good friends, but... Um, you know, he got older and he had to, to, to focus. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. He had to focus on focus. Yeah. yeah. But um, so my, my music side kind of went first to the direction that I focused on my own music and not being the hired guy that plays the ideal and the ideas of other people. Sure. sure. So. So and, and, and um, you know, being this uh, freelance guy at Jusen Kettner, I always came up with ideas and product ideas and I had like, I designed the tube man, I designed the rotosphere, all their pedals, um, their all tube amp, um, which was like a, a 13 tube loaded all tube amplifier, tri amp was my concept and idea and um, blah, blah, blah. So I had many ideas, but how to, to express myself? Uh, using Ketna grow and there were more people involved and they had a marketing department and they, they got more and more professional. And the more people were involved in the process, the less I could, you know, um, do my thing. It's, it's like, okay, we have 20 people in big meetings talking about the next product. And um, uh, at the beginning, it was like, hey, do you have an idea for a pedal? And I said, sure, you know, let's do a pedal that nobody else does. And I came up with this tube driven rotosphere, which is a Leslie simulator. Right. Leslie, which is like a, a, a rotating speaker sure. cabinet, right. ma mainly used for organs. But, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, nobody had a pedal that did this for the guitar players. And um, I'm, as a musician, I know that I knew that that sound was used by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and John McLaughlin and uh, Aerosmith. And, you know, nobody had a pedal like that. And of course, I wanted a pedal like that. And so I came up with the idea and using Katna built that thing. And um, later on, when there were like 20 people involved, I had 
ideas that were kind of uh, a bit too advanced or I had to convince too many people and the process got uh, probably you a know, little political <laughs> political and a, a bit too complicated yeah so yeah. you know and and the, the same thing is like with the music I, I came up with the idea uh, being my own boss is is something that can have so I can have my I, Deers in 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 like a very puristic way, and uh, maybe one of the the qualities that I have is I have visions. It's like when I dream about me. Just for example, my instrumental life record. It's something of course, based on all the stuff that I have on my CDs, but it's like, I can dream that thing even before the concert happens. It's like, I can simply sit there and think about it. And, and I, I know already how the concert works. It's, it's like in my head, you know? And so I get a vision of what I want and I, I can do the same thing like in electronics. It's like, I can sit there and just think about stuff. And yeah, these ideas I can work on in my head and there's there's even a process um, that I uh, use to, to to do that. I I love riding the push bike, you know, a regular bicycle. Mm -hmm. And um, when I just go on my push bike and spend an hour on on that, my my head is free. And and this is I start with an idea, and when I come back, I have the solution. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a good way. Yeah. I mean, I do that. I go out and we have uh, where we live is uh, yeah. called something called the Back Bay and and uh, lots of places to walk. So I go out and walk for 45 mm -hmm. or 60 minutes uh, right. and does the same thing. Yeah. Right. And you know, most of my melodies that I composed, they, they, they are composed on, on, on the bike because I, I whistle them. And OK, nowadays I, I can kind of sing or whistle them to my cell phone. Uh, and back in the days, I was using a, a dictaphone from my father from the university uh -huh. sure. to, 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 to memorize the melodies. So I'm, I never used notation big time. I mean, this is like very lousy <laughs> because I never needed to. It's all in my head, you know, and then to express myself, I need a little bit of paper, but not too much. <laughs> yeah. And it's, this is how, how I. I always worked and kind of still work, of course, now with computer programs, everything. Um, uh, but I, I believe it is about having a clear vision, having a clear concept. Uh, it's the first thing before you get lost into details. Details is it's another step in the evolution of a product or of, of a song or, you know, whatever you do. And uh I like to spend more time at the at the at the first stage. I think that's the, that's the main. Well, that's thing critical. Because, that's critical. That's what we sort of call the foundational uh, principle stage, right. where you really build uh, something solid to put all the complexity on top of. Because you could it's right. easy to make things complicated, but if you haven't taken care of the simple stuff. You yes. know, it's like building a house of cards. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And when I look at products, for instance, I can see beautiful products and I can see how people deal with products. I mean, just for an example, if you look at the Fender Stratocaster, which is my main guitar that I use, it's a design by Leo Fender from the 50s. And this thing is so well thought through. Every detail is makes so much sense, you know, the bolt on neck, um, the five or not, it was a, a three way switch back then, but it's a five way switch where it's positioned, where your hand goes. It, hey, all the details it's on this guitar to me, it's like totally right. Um, and I can see where it's coming from. It's, it is watching other players maybe and being, you know, an electronic guy and, And, and the mechanics guy, he spent, I'm, I'm sure he spent most of the time on, on the, the design uh, stage, not on the, um, uh, you know, polishing the last uh, detail stage. Yeah, Other think, people did that sure. later on, you yeah, know. And, and, and so this basic design is still, I think, the most popular guitar on the planet up to until today, I, if I'm 
Right, I, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's the most popular guitar design. And um, if I look at some other products, I can see, okay, it's an old principle and it's, uh, of course, it's optimized and another optimization. And But I kind of like the beauty of the originals, you know, mm -hmm. of the, so, and Well, that's my thing. And I'm doing the same thing with, with my products and my music. It's uh, I can play fast, but there's uh, millions of faster players. And uh, I claim to have a good melody when I, you know, I'm not happy with my songs when, uh, unless I have a good melody, I can still listen to, to my first ever solo record because the melodies are good. You know, maybe the production technique has changed. But the songwriting is, the melody makes sense. And that, that's what the foundation of the song is. And that's never outdated. And this is like a good song. And that's like a good product. It's like a Stratocaster. Or if, if, if I think about some of my product designs, they, I, I hope they have the same quality. <laughs> so the impetus for you to start Blue Guitar was that, you wanted to be able to develop your own ideas and have control over it. And so how did that manifest? How did that all get started? Right. I mean, there's like uh, on several layers, there are things going on. One, one is what you just talked about is me being more focused on my own ideas, having more people to deal with. Um, so this, um, was not the same confident um, setting for me like it was at the beginning at my using Kettner days. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, um, the, there was like, uh, I talked to using Kettner at the very beginning to make tube amps uh, and pure tube amps to be non-compromised in tone because this was what I knew about my Vox AC30 and my Marshall Plexi and my Fender Blackface Super Reverb, uh, etc. So this was the first step. And then, you know, having these amps um, as a reference and designing amps um, with that kind of quality, um, the marketing of using Katner back then was at the level, okay, it must be tubes. If it's not tubes, it's no good which was true for that moment. But I could see the next level of technology coming up, which was not a di digital technology because I've worked five years on a digital project going all the way and even getting awarded for a product by the American Guitar Player magazine to be the boss of digital amps. Um, so the quality was super high, but my uh, personal feeling was like it is as good as it gets in the digital world and of course things even get better but um i knew where the critical things in the digital domain were and, and still are and 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 so i was convinced to go all analog um and use tube but not the old school tube technology and i I experimented with that technology also together with some other technicians, uh, friends, and and then I came to the result, the future is analog for, for, for the non-compromised tone. Um, if it's not 100% old tube um, technology, it needs to be analog and it needs to be um, a special technology analog, but you know, what why make another old school tube amp if there are already thousands around and they are great, you know? So I had the other experience of being a player to lug around my heavy tube amps and, uh, and, and doing my own music meant that I had to carry my gear myself. And, and I want to get lighter, more compact, smaller. Yeah. And this, um, gave me the energy to, towards a new project, which uh, is what I call now the nanotube technology, which is all analog using a tube, but using a lot of discrete and all kinds of different analog technologies to recreate exactly what I know from tube amps, but not using 
this uh, old materials. Right. Um, right. And that was the that was the concept that got you really started, right? Yeah. And I went to all these trade shows and I was waiting for other companies to do it. And this was in my head already like, I don't know, 10, 15 years from now when I go back and and nobody went for it. And I, I talked to Jusen Kettner and I said, oh, no, we do tube amps. We do tube amps. Um, and because it's a business and it's it is a, a marketing positioning and everything. But I was so convinced about this future that I said, hey, guys, somebody has to do it. If you don't do it, I do it myself. And well, this is what happened. <laughs> I, I did it myself and I had my first prototypes. Um, I used them on, on little gigs when I played with my band, uh, like hidden behind my th uh, real 13 tubes loaded uh, all tube amp. There was a little plastic box with, uh, yeah, which was actually working, which was my amp. And the rest was just to show. <laughs> oh. And people didn't notice the difference. I che first checked it with, with my fellow musicians in the band, and they, they didn't notice. It was, for them, it was as good as, you know, the Triumph or, you know, 13 loaded tube amp. So, and I thought, hey, if it's that good, uh, and I, I knew it was good, but so they didn't notice a difference. And then, of course, I worked on it and um, I got it to the level that I've in the end founded my own company. And um, that's how Blue Guitar got started. When was that? How long ago did uh, Blue Guitar actually come to life? Well, I I decided to found my own company in 2014. Okay, that sounds about and, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then in thirteen I already had my own prototypes, um, and I used the prototypes um, so, uh, even in twelve. Uh, of course, there's, uh, I have to think about the, all the different stages. You know, sure. <laughs> I had a fifty watt word version of it. I had a, a hundred watt version with more channels and stuff like that. But um, this is the product that's called Amp One now, or. Is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. This was uh, this was uh, you know prototypes um, of what's now called the M1. And um, in 2014, you know, I I did the official act of founding the company and um, going to the first trade show with my own brand, registering the brand, which is also a nice story. Uh, talking business is like my my name is Thomas Blug B L U G. And I always had the problem for the Americans, especially to, to call me Mr. Blug and not Mr. Black. <laughs> <Right. laughs> and, uh, and I always said, you know, it's like, uh, hey, Blug, like blue, like blue guitar, blue G guitar, Blug. Ah. So and for me, it was obvious to call my, my brand then Blue Guitar because it's my last name. And guitar, which is what and I I'm didn't, doing. I didn't realize that when I first heard uh, yeah. of you when Blue Guitar, and I think remember getting some press releases back uh, yeah. in our when we were doing uh, an early version of Guitar PR, we were getting releases right. from other people, and I saw stuff that came in from Blue Guitar. We might have even published some of it at that time. <laughs> well, um, we don't do that part of it anymore, but. But I remember seeing Blue Guitar, but I didn't realize at the, at the time, of course, that it was Thomas Blug. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is, in German law, maybe in American as well, I would never be able to register Blue Guitar as a brand because it describes a thing, a blue colored guitar. OK, we are missing the E, but um, a description of a thing usually is not possible. But since it's my proper last name, Blug, you know, um, the, the the office, the uh, what is it? Trade, patent office. Patent tra office, trademark. Yeah, yeah. office accepted, you yeah, know. Yeah, nice. So <laughs> it's a great logo, too. I mean, it, it you know, you once people know that it's Thomas Blue, you know, you see it in the name, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it works perfectly. And it's it's the two sides of myself. One is like the handwritten Blug, which is like the artist mm -hmm. and the. Guitar is like the is more like a, um, a a standard font that is uh, uh, can be replicated. Uh, yeah. Looks like yeah, um, it represents the two parallel universes that you live in, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's all in there. In the 
and that this is all I do basically. And I don't need any more, you know? So, <laughs> so, uh, amp one has been, it was refined and, um, and is a, right. still, you know, that's had, there's had been some expansion of that and you're doing some other things with it. Tell us a little bit more about what the company has evolved into and what you're doing with it now. Right. So the M1, of course, was the first product to show. So I went on, on the Frankfurt Messe trade show and I had this. What is it? It's, it's, it's a stomp box amplifier with a nano tube. So it looks like a pedal. It is a pedal. And my biggest problem was to explain the world. This is not what you think it is. It's really an ampl <laughs> it, amplifier head disguised as a pedal, right? <laughs> Exactly. So, and then people always ask the same question, but where's your amp? I said, it says amp one. Where is your amp? It is the amp. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, my demo usually goes, okay, this is the power. So this is your main lead, plug it in here. This is your guitar lead. This goes into the input and this is your speaker cabinet. Okay. And then you plug it in and you ha have a hundred watt like Marshall head and you can kill it. And then, and this is the moment where they go, ah, now I understand. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and the cabinet is not powered. No, it's a passive cabinet. Okay. So good. That's, so th this is, this is the, the first, um, um, product. And I had to, to, to do so many demos that, that style to show it. And of course I came up with a cabinet that is also compact and has a big tone, which was actually the cabinet that I was privately using uh, myself even 15 years ago. Even in the using cabinet days, I had my own cabinet because I was not so happy with <laughs> what they built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, I put uh, my, my blue guitar logo on it and sold it as the fat cap. Um, so is the which, is is the cabinet in some way optimized for use with the amp one or any, or not? Y yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, it works very well with the amp one um, from the voicing and things, but. Basically, it's it is the sound of a four by twelve cabinet, which you know four by twelve cabinets mm -hmm. is a classic in cabinets. There's uh, you know open back combos like Fender combos, and there's two by twelve boxes uh, open back or close back, and and the four by twelve sound is like my personal sound preference, and I, I was just having um i just made this cabinet myself to get this kind of big low-end rock punchy sound but i wanted to have it as small as possible and then i, I made a one by 12 cabinet with a bass portation and uh, a big inner resonance kind of thing to to get that four by 12 sound but in a one by one wow. by 12 format wow. so and it, of course if you play country it's maybe not the best cabinet but it's definitely a great rock cabinet blues rock cabinet i would say sure and and so this was like uh, an obvious product for me because i played that cabinet anyway and then i had my amp and so there was like uh, the amp one and the fat cap and then the the next thing i thought is like you know the amp one is so small how small can I do a 12 inch cabinet and then I took a 12 inch speaker I made a housing for it and I had a a, 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 a back the back plate the back wall could be moved and I simply tuned it with you know just like a box and and experimented where was the best spot to, to have this the back wall and uh, so this was my little cube and I, I found out if it's not deep enough it sounds not so good and if it's too deep it also it's 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 not a good sound so this was the first parameter to fix in the smallest one by 12 cabinet and then next level was to work on uh, like a portation system to expand the low range with extra low end to make this little box sounding even bigger and uh, this became the nano cap which okay. was then my third product. So I had an M1, a, a fat cap and a nano cap. And then I came up with a, a remote, uh, which is a, a, a remote pedal that goes with M1 that is powered by M1. And that gives you extra functionalities and makes the whole M1 programmable. So I can 
go MIDI and save presets and blah, blah, blah. I have this. And then this remote one has another expansion, um, which I call the looper kit, which is a, a pedal switcher. Since the M1 is a pedal and it sits on the pedal board, if, if you, I mean, that's one way of using it. And then with, in combination with the remote one, I used it in that combination, but I had also, you know, some noisy pedals from that I love from the past, like uh, a small stone phaser and some boosters and blah, 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 you know, stuff that I used before. And um, to, to, to switch those pedals into the signal path, I needed a, a pedal switcher. And then I designed the pedals, pedal switcher expansion for this remote. So this became the next product, you know, so the whole product range simply evolved by solving my personal problems. <laughs> so that's another great uh, example of how those, as I've sort of coined them, parallel universes work together and, and feed each other. Right. And, you know, up to that day, I never even made typical business decisions in a way like, okay, how make how, how to make Blue Guitar the most profitable company? You know, I know if you are, if you run a business, you should wear that hat as well. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe it's a mistake, but on the other hand, it's like, I do products that nobody else does. Because, you know, if I want to be in competition with big players, I will never be successful, you know? So I do the things that nobody else does. <laughs> Um, and this helped Blue Guitar being what the slogan is, which is tone innovation. So if it's something that other companies don't do, it's good for Blue Guitar. And if it has, has a great tone, it's good for the musician. So it makes sense and we will sell it. Uh, well, so tell me a little bit um, about how the company operates today and, uh, you know, in terms of product flow and that sort of thing. Right. I mean, you know, I started here in Germany. I had some, I hired a, a sales manager um, and I hired another international sales manager because, you know, from my past, I knew, you know, a lot of distributors in like Italy, in the UK, uh, all over the world, basically, because I've been a demonstrator for using Ketner in all these countries. And, um, the, of course, this made made it easy for me at the beginning because I could simply ask some of these co uh, companies if they would be interested in distributing Blue Guitar products. And you had great and, relationships to start off with. That really makes a difference, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, of course. I mean, a network and relationships is everything in business. On the other hand, is like um, I needed an electronic engineer because my electronic skills are not at... The, the proper like uh, manufacturing level engineer. I'm more the sound designer that can tweak stuff, but you know, how to make a, a switch mode power supply or, you know, a class D amp. There's, I've always worked with technicians and, and I can do the cheesy analog last bits, mm -hmm. you know, like, like doing, um, the last colorations and filters and that, that, that kind of level is easy for me modifying amplifiers, but I need somebody that does the platform and I'm totally aware of what the platform has to deliver, which is also very, very important because I have to find the right people to work with. So, you know, the, the, the quality of an engineer um, I can I can tell by talking with these people what what they are able to do, and and if I would like to work with them, and and so of course I had a lot of you know contacts in the past, and I've always worked with other guys, you know, even in my using Kettner days, I brought other engineers to the company just to 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 broaden their spectrum, you know, so. At a certain point, I, I had two other uh, technicians coming to the to using Kettner just because they had different style of technology and of, of tone as well. And um, it's like 
if you work with 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 chefs in a restaurant, you know, this a guy that that does the best uh, whatever. Typical German cooking is different from French. Yeah, or that's for sure. Know? <laughs> and um, you know, I, I I see myself also like a somebody that uh, understands a bit, has his own recipes, but. I like to to taste other people's recipes as well mm -hmm. in, in technology and music. <laughs> so you okay, have a you have a you have a small staff of people now and right yeah we have about five six people mm -hmm. and the rest is freelance guys you know yeah, we, well that's the the new economy I mean that's the way a lot of companies right. operate today but you have uh, distribution all over the world now you have international distribution yeah. correct yeah and I have. Um, um, a, a little office with uh, like five people working there um, and um, the rest is freelance guys and I I don't want to have a big company like you know I've seen th that's also good for my past with using Canada I've seen bigger operations bigger structures and I don't like it I like a, a small team because it's the same thing like in the music in the music I can improvise the smaller the, the band, the easier it gets. It's like my main band nowadays is called Rock Anarchy, and it's basically a three-piece band. So you know we can go on stage and we can uh, we can play uh, we can do a set list, or even on stage I can I can start a song that we never rehearsed, and and they will follow me, and and it's instant, you know, creating the moment. And that's the beauty of a small team. And if you have a big team, there's so much communication involved and convincing and egos that you have to talk to, you know. <laughs> so my company is, is, is a small team and I want to keep it as small as possible. Well, I think that's a good strategy. And I, I, I follow the <clears throat> same thing here, too. I mean, it's, we're a very mm -hmm. small company and um, I've, I've done the, the same thing with you. I mean, I've certainly had the big corporate uh, uh -huh. experience. And uh -huh. uh, now after many years later, this is this is a much way, better way to do it. And I think people who are younger are also uh -huh. recognizing that that's uh, that has a lot of advantages and it gives you an opportunity to really make moves in the market that uh, that bigger companies just can't do or they can't turn on a dime. They can't uh, they get so kind of bogged down in committees and trying to make decisions with big studies and try to, uh -huh. you know, uh, and, and it's not to say that there's not a place for that, but it does give you the advantage of being able to move around with greater right. ease than larger companies do. So yeah. tell me a little bit about what's on the horizon. I mean, you're, where, where are you thinking things are going? Uh, mm -hmm. What does the future look like both for your company and for Thomas Blug? Right. Yeah, I, I just totally agree on what you just said about, you know, when you when when you look at the, the current situation of markets, of technologies, um, of distribution. I mean, we all see that big companies go direct and that there is like um, a new way of selling products. I mean, in the old days, it was like little small guitar stores in every village has one. Now that we have the internet, we are global. Uh, you know, I can use the, the social media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. And so, I, I see a lot of opportunities in like marketing. Um, I see a lot of ways to get my, my product sold without being uh, in a big setting in a way. Um, okay, when now looking at, at the future and, and the current situation of the market, myself and Blue Guitar, um, I would say it's quite simple. Uh, me being a reference point is one thing, but I also have a lot of um, musician friends and um, M1 was designed by myself as the Thomas Blug is happy with this amplifier product. <laughs> okay, and now talking to other colleagues, it's like, you know, I'm more like a bluesy, blues rock player with uh, you know the traditional tones i hear people going like hey man I, I wish you would do something like this for me i'm a metal guy okay so um 
there's like tonal areas that that I will go to, which is fun for me because I can be in another role. I'm the sound designer, but I'm not the the player of these sounds. And I learn from other players how to play metal, how to what, how to to have the, the the best trunk and 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 stuff like that. And this this is exciting to me too. And now I'm open to do that because my amp one and the new Mercury edition is I have the stuff that I want uh, at least for the moment. Of course, <laughs> I always have some some ideas and and it's like music it never stops and you have um, you, you you might write a new tune in a in a similar direction but that has a little bit more sparkle here and there and it's the same with tones well, it's kind of like um, a can being in a candy store you know there's a lot of yeah. options you just don't want to eat too much candy at one time <laughs> that's it <laughs> absolutely yeah um so but if you look at the products i'm doing it's like I consider this this a very logical progression in 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 the amplification world. It's like okay, I'm an electric guitar player, so I I'm not into the acoustic guitars that much. I do have a few acoustic guitars, but this is something for other companies and other players. For me, it's about what what what's the future of the electric guitar? And one way of the future is definitely. I see, let's put it that way. I see three, three big uh, streams. One is the traditional good old tube amps. They will never die because they are iconic and they are the real deal tone wise. And, and it's the thing, it's the thing playing, uh, you know, a wood guitar with, with vintage pickups over a vintage amps. I mean, I'm like that. I have a big collection of vintage amps at home and there's a beauty about that. And it's like, yeah, you go to your garage and you have your whatever 61 Chevy in the garage and I play my 61 Stratocaster. And this is, I know technology advances and, but there's a beauty of doing that, you know? So, and music is such a, an emotional thing. So I see this kind of going on for the next decades um, for sure. And so the, the other the other stream I would say is the digital world. Everything goes digital. You know we have programs here and then there, and your mobile phone is your guitar amp. And I'm I've been down that road deep enough to know that it's not my cup of tea. It's something that I highly respect, and I I love certain products and even certain technologies which are superior to analog technology, I will use, like I'm using convolution technology for my speaker emulation because that's the best way to do speaker emulation. I'm the, I'm, I'm the analog guy, the, the tube guy. And this is what I will do in the future is I will do analog amps, nanotube, which means I, I have amplifiers that, that, that are equal as good equally as good and have as much character as the real deal amps and lately i've done a lot of a b comparison videos where i can actually prove that you cannot feel the diff feel or hear the difference against any old classic tube amp my technology is is as good period i've i've fooled so many people so that i know <laughs> and the products they are just uh, lightweight like I have the tenth of the weight and tenth of the size, so which is uh, the, the modern uh, uh, reality of guitar players. Anyhow, it's like travel light. You know, you have fly gigs. Um, you don't hire big, you know, uh, trucks with with gear anymore. You you go somewhere, and if you travel with your guitar, and now you can even travel with your nano tube amplifier and you know what you're getting you, the only thing you have to to hire or use from somebody else is maybe the speaker and and that's that's the thing it and makes it makes an awful lot of sense uh how do you see growth and and what has the growth curve looked like uh for your company and do you and do you see that continuing well i think I'm just at the beginning of the whole of the whole uh, how to express it blue guitar 
um, Blue Guitar is a new company, you know, right. how many years is it not, now? So, not too long. So you're really, you, yeah. you feel like you're just really starting to get your footing now pretty well, huh? Right. I mean, if I go into a music store in the US and ask, hey, do you have a Blue Guitar Amp 1? Chances are 99% that they say, so, uh, no, we don't. And then it's about 70% they go, I've never heard of that brand, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, 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 you know, my first job is uh, to make people aware that I even exist. So that's the first thing. And, and then of course, the more people understand that they, the more people have to dare to use uh, just this kind of lightweight and small products, because it's like, I said at the beginning, like most people don't believe it's like, no, this can't, cannot be true. But, you know, there's every day I have another, you know, um, guitar player and some famous guys like just Ryan Roxy of Alice Cooper band just to use, start to use my product. And then there's, you know, Saga uh, and blah, blah, blah. More and more people discover it and more and more professional players are actually using my products, which then proves that the stuff is real and that, that yeah. the ordinary guitar player actually believes that too and will follow up. You well, know? well, you know, Thomas, I always say that, uh, you know, most uh, success is incremental. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a good friend of mine that I've learned a lot from many years ago tell me that that all success is gradual, sequential, uh -huh. and cumulative. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. um, it sounds like you're on that on that path and uh, everything takes time, no matter how impatient we get at certain uh -huh. times, uh, you know, sticking with it and being persistent. And I, I, uh -huh. I said that a couple of weeks ago was one of the topics I covered. Persistence uh, often uh -huh. trumps everything else and you got to stick with it. You've been doing it a long time. And uh, you've got a tremendous background and, and tremendous knowledge. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just, a, you know, it's quite a good story. And, you know, we're, we're just about out of time. But I, uh, right. I, I'm just, uh, there's so much more. And I'm hopefully uh, we can get together another time and, and talk about some other topics. But um, this has been just a great, a great interview. And I think that <laughs> a lot of people... Uh -huh. are going to uh, find out something more about blue guitar that they didn't know uh, and hopefully cause them to, you know, look a little further. And they're probably going to find out a little bit more about Thomas Blue, uh -huh. who maybe they didn't realize is, uh, you know, a, a major force in the, in the music world, uh, certainly in, in your part of the world, but, but um, probably uh, will get to be known more over here as well. So... It's just been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I wish we right. could go on yeah. further, but but I really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, spend it with us on GBR. Yeah, big, big pleasure. And my, my biggest problem is I have too many ideas, you know. <laughs> I mean, even, you know, I have products in my head, I have music in my head, and I have to simply to postpone it because, and, and the, the biggest lesson I learned myself is your resources are limited and you also have a private life and keep things in balance that's a, that's a very very good very very good notion and that's uh probably some great advice uh to yeah. end the interview on and you know you got so many right. things going on uh right. that i know we're gonna have to uh catch up a little bit uh, down the road and uh and we'll definitely talk again sure will be a pleasure yeah anytime yeah great well i really appreciate you coming on and we'll talk again soon So what did you think of the interview with Thomas Blug? We always want to hear from you. You can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business. You can email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com and you know the drill. If none of that works for you, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888 777 2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later. Operators are currently on strike, but management personnel are supposed to be filling in, but mostly I think they're just filling up. So, another lengthy interview, but wow, what a career. And Thomas is still a fairly young guy by today's standards. 
Important to note that because it's the same standard I rely on for myself and other middle-aged people like me, really. Now, I saw Thomas as leading two parallel careers. One is a respected player and, and the other is a technical guru of sorts. But it was clear to me during the conversation that Thomas saw his career as intertwined at some point, And so I came up with the title at the intersection of parallel careers. I'm not sure if that's technically right. Some may argue that it's not because how can parallel paths cross? I don't know. Maybe that kind of thinking is just too narrow. Something else I thought was interesting was his description of the initial introduction of the AMP1 product. It was different, but Thomas knew exactly what he had created. It was his vision, and he brought it to life. But it was different. Not everybody got it at first. Their preconceived ideas or expectations of what a guitar amp should look like, well, they got in the way. However, once he was able to explain and demo the AMP1, folks started to get it, and that opened the door. Other related products followed, and Blue Guitar has legs now. I'm sure we'll continue to see more development and products to follow. But isn't it interesting how often new ideas, no matter how useful, efficient, beneficial they are, well, they get stalled because people can't get past their narrow expectations of how things ought to be. Sound familiar? Kind of like defining a single road to your destination, firmly believing that it's the only way you'll get there. What happens if the road washes out, or worse, falls victim to a highway reconstruction program scheduled to take the next five years to complete? It happens, doesn't it? What then? You may remember a couple of episodes ago from my interview with Dave Wish of Little Kids Rock that I followed up on his discussion about persistence. And that was the single most powerful process in contributing to the realization of a vision, or destination as I like to say. I think we can see that in Thomas Blug and his vision for Blue Guitar. Generally speaking, you have to keep moving forward to get where you want to go. And I can think of nothing more appropriate in the way of advice than to stay positive. Stay focused on your destination or destinations. But remember, keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. So important. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on episode 58. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.